Here's a couple things. Here's a couple things. One is Reverend Seiko, I want to make a comment. Can we, if you have a question, maybe two, a couple people line up at this mic right here, and we got a mic right here if you have a question, keyword question. And I'm going to, don't answer this, uh, Reverend Seiko. I want you to think about this because one of the things I'm moved by with uh, Reverend Seiko is his grassroots on the ground organizing to change the system. Um, it's powerful. It's, it's, it's robust, it's unfiltered, I love it. Some folks, as much as they love justice, they're not getting in front of no tanks, right? They're just not gonna, they, they're not gonna do it. And so as, as this conversation kind of takes place, I may want you to end on, you specifically, on some of that transformative work people can do within institutions, within organizations, and within systems. All right, y'all, we're gonna try to make, this is what we're gonna try to do. Yeah, we're going to rapid fire. We're going to take some questions, right? You say your question. Um, you can walk away from the mic. I'm going to take like three, and then each of you try to respond within a minute or two to their questions. Is that fair? So we're going to start here with my brother. Uh, yeah, just give us your question. Yeah, I, I start with the basis of black liberation theology being white liberation theology for me. Mm -hmm. the, the next is, once you're in that context, and you think about the white church, the responsibilities of bearing power as citizens has not been addressed by clergy or scholars of the white stripe in 30 years, okay. basically. Right. Maybe a few exceptions. I want to know, because I've just read Edward Baptist's wonderful book on slavery and capitalism. Why aren't we doing a theology of capitalism got under the question. agents of slavery? Got you, got you. All right, y'all, so check it out. I love the energy. I love what he was saying, but let's get quicker to the questions. Oh, we're not going to be able to get through this. The question is, why are we not having a theological conversation on capitalism, um, kind of post-slavery and in that era? Tell me your question, then I'm going to go here. What's your question? Yep. First, I should warn you, I'm old, and I don't get to church very often, so that's my bias. Okay. But one of the things that psychologists tell us, and our experience tells us, is that, is that people, when we want them to change, we need to keep them off the defensive, because when they get on the defensive, they dig in their heels. Now, we all recognize... All right, just tell me your police, question, though. No, I like that. You got to go all, to your question. We all recognize the police desperately need to change. What suggestions do the, do the panel have for what we can do as individuals gotcha. and what we can do as organizations right. to help keep the police from becoming so defensive that they don't listen and refuse to change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, pause. Everybody pause. We're going to reset this. Got his question. It kind of deals with the what's the role of people, um, the church and individuals, but also the defensiveness. That's, that's real. People can get defensive and they think they're getting beat up on and they want to change. I'm going to say something, y'all, and I say this in the spirit of everything good. If the next person doesn't get to a question immediately, I'm shutting down the microphone conversation. Straight up. I'm just going to shut it down. Right? One other question. You've been standing patiently. Give us your question. You are going to shape the rest of this discussion. You don't get to a question, we're done. Uh, <laughs> being honest. My question is, since one of the themes of this panel has been diversity, and since uh, diversity in every field of education, question, comma, uh, <laughs> when when an editor no hold on y'all let him speak let him speak, comma, when an editor of the New York Times today says that less than ten percent of diversity in such prominent corporations as Facebook, Google, etc., yeah. is because we executives of these big companies go around the country and we look for diversity and in prominent universities, in technical schools, we question? can't find people I got of you. color. I got you. Yeah, we got it. Hey, got no it. more questions, y'all. So wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up. One, no, no, no. Oh, no. you want the sister? We got the sister. We got you. Black Lives Matter. We got you. I see you. And and I, 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 if I, and, 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 and Glenn will get me for this because I'm out of turn or whatever. Could I just see some questions from some young folk, please? Just some of these babies. Some of these babies. Come. Yeah, yeah. My sister, go ahead and say your question, though. We, 
Trust us. We're, we're catching these. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, Portland is so liberal and progressive. Can you tell me what uh, you think can be done in terms of the social determinants of health to address this black, the black killing of the black body? Yes. Give it up for that question. That's a question. Thank you. We're going to pause right now. And anything that y'all heard from the questions and editorials, please respond. <laughs> well, I loved her question about the social determinants of health. Right now, the city of Portland and Multnomah County both have $45 million that they didn't know they'd have in their general fund. We have a mayor who says that he's supporting the Black Male Achievement Initiative. Do you know what his budget request was for the Black Male Achievement Initiative? $100,000 and one staff person. Wow. You got 45 million extra bucks. Black men are at the bottom everywhere. You would think that if you really were committed to Black Male Achievement, you'd come up with a little bit more than $100,000. So one of the things we can like do it. is put pressure on the city to fully fund a black male achievement project Absolutely. that actually leads to good outcomes for black men. And, um, and imagine this to your point, Joanne, it's actually ran by black people. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Right, 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 exactly. Run by black people who have a history of working with people in the community That's right. and they have a success record. Not Amen. just the ones that show up in the pretty suits and say, yeah, give me the contract. Amen, right on. Come on. Hi, um, I, was I was wondering what advice you guys would have for future leaders that want to support the Black Lives Matter movement but are often criticized saying all lives matter. Ooh. Great question. Seiko, I want you to jump on that. Well, the idea that all, my, all lives matters is a lie. It's just a lie. Like, there's, there's no way, and, that, and it's interesting, all lives matters is a discursive response to Black Lives Matter, so it's ultimately grounded in racism. So that the very notion of centering black lives becomes a disruptive, becomes disruptive to the discourse, right? I mean, we live in a nation so recalcitrant that the stating of the obvious becomes a revolutionary act. So saying black life matters, which is a pretty obvious statement, not like, you know what I'm saying, it's not like we're calling for a redistribution of wealth. <laughs> we just saying stop killing us. I mean, that's not like a revolutionary notion, right? But we live, the nation is so recalcitrant, so the stating of the obvious becomes a revolutionary act. So when we say black lives matters and people respond by saying all lives matter, it is a way, in a way in which to diminish the humanity of black people and reinscribe that very thing over and again. My sister right here. You can, you can pull the mic down. Um, so I basically just have a question on how do we implicate like the school system and how can youth in schools say that Black Lives Matter because there's institutional racism within the systems at school? Yeah, that's a great question. Hey, can I take that? Joanne? So one of the things uh, that I'm just thrilled about is black, um, uh, black student uh, uh, councils have been developed in all the high schools. So there's like, there are groups that are starting in each high school in Oregon. Jefferson is by far the most advanced. But get with other young people in your school Invite in folks that can help you learn how to become organizers. Um, this is not rocket science, right? Uh, it's, it, what you need is passion. Yeah. What you need is an ass. Uh, as Frederick Douglass says, power succeeds nothing without an ass. Never has, never will, right? And so for young people, uh, we are here to help you. I, I don't want them to think that we're just like waiting for them to fail. We are here. We are waiting to be asked. Some of us are already out in the street working with young people. And it's amazing. When you ask them what they want, they tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let me, Damon, yeah. let me say one thing to that. Uh, being on the campus, uh, it, it, I mean, Hollis started on the east side uh, because there really wasn't any black male or female presence there. And you got all these black families displaced that 
direction. And so the school was just hungry to get any kind of black presence there. Now, when we got there, um, there were some troubling things that I saw. And so we saw a need within HALA to create some culturally responsive stuff around mentoring. I'm telling you, if you just show up and just being black and present uh, is one of the first steps to bringing change. Now, putting a little more pressure on these, because obviously these teachers have been socialized to see black kids who they weren't prepared for, by the way, because of gentrification. Um, you showing up, right? You, you, just being black, you become an authority on what's in the best interest of young black kids. So, you know, we don't have enough mentors. We don't have enough folks willing to show up and to serve these black kids so that they see people like them. So that's my encouragement. Like, if you yeah. want to affect black kids or right. kids of color on the campus, these principals are hungry for people of color to show up and be there and be present and be consistent. That's right. So, and one thing I would say to the yeah. sister that asked the question is on pretty much every campus that I can, that we can, you know, see in Portland or at large, everybody's trying to do some type of a black student union or some black student organization. And I think it's incumbent upon these college students who are creating these black student unions to reach back and work with these students in high school, and that becomes part of your programming pretty consistently. Because the reality of it is, is a lot of the black student organizations, and there's research, there's everything on it, they become so individualistic by the, the, you know, by the president or by the vice president, then they graduate, the movement's going with them. You know what I mean? So you gotta be able to create some consistency and develop some infrastructure that it can sustain without a charismatic personality. So that's what I would say as well. And then the institutions need to have pressure beyond just those student organizations that values um, black thought and black um, experiences and perspectives in the curriculum. So when folks are trying to do education and programming for the institutions, it's not looked at as an adjunct to the movement. It's looked at something that's part and parcel of the mainstream conversation. That's what I would say. Okay, so we know that listening and dis deep listening is very important, but we also know that most churches are very um, segregated on Sunday. So how are you going to open up these congregations so they can listen to each other and have the information so they can really come from an empowering context and help the community create possibilities and transformation that will truly make a difference? Thank you for your question. Reverend Sake, hit that up for us. I mean, I, one thing for me is that religion is as religion does. Religion is a lot like hip-hop. If the people on the move, religion going to be on the move. Right, it wasn't preachers who led Ferguson, right? It was some people in the street, some kids hit the street and then the clergy, we showed up late. And so the same thing is that as, as the question for me is of religious institutions is what is their proximity to social movement? So when, if the people are turned up, are you there with them and are you in relationship with them and then are you using Sunday morning and Wednesday night as a way to reflect on what's happening in these communities? Okay. And I, do, I just do want to say, back to why it's on my mind, you're right, we don't want everybody in the street because if you're scared, we don't need you there. <laughs> right, so, but, but what we do know is that you understand that them being in the street is a holy act. Right. Right. That 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 is uh, that that. And so you may like we got folks, you know, like for a lot of when we do civil disobedience training, you know, a lot of people, if they can't hold the discipline, we ask them to get off the line. But and there's plenty you can do. You can do jail support. Right. That you can cook for people when people are coming out of jail after protesting. You can meet them. Imagine that a whole bunch of black mothers from a, uh, from from one of these old churches and these babies been protesting. And when they come out of jail, the mama's there waiting on them. Come on here, baby. Get you some of this to eat now. Right. Like that. Those are ways in which people can the ways in which people can uh, can participate. But in addition to what you raised about the theology, which I don't want to lose track of. Right is that the vast majority of religion in America, like when your churches tell you, well, we're not political, that's a political statement. Right, right, right. right. That's, that's a political statement. When they say we're not, no, actually you are political. 
right? And, and the politics are playing themselves out, right? They're planning themselves out if you've got women in leadership. It's playing themselves out in terms of what's your position on gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. It's playing itself out in terms of if you're encouraging people to vote for certain candidates because they believe your certain messages. So the idea that churches are not political is a political statement and that you have to be willing to confront those kind of political exercises at work. All right, I'm sorry, y'all, but this is my brother right here. This is going to be the last question. Wait, 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 What's up? Wait, 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 can we do me a favor? Can we do these three young people roll around? Roll roll? Yeah, yeah, rapid fire. All right, so you three be able to share your question. Um, how would you find justice and what does it look like? Mm. How would you find justice? No, how would you define, define justice, justice and what does it look like? Excellent. Thanks for the question. How do you develop a theology from below? Okay, Eric, you're gonna hit up this theology from below question because it, fr it came from, no, I'm saying it came from your story, man, of the Diego Rivera, that came from that. So I want you to hit that up. I want you to be able, I want, for these folks, Joanne, can you talk about defining justice yes. for that question? And then what's your question, my sister? How do you have college un institutions understand, even though they have diversity in their statements and that they wanna be inclusive, to how do, even though they have these in their statements, right. but they don't understand the people that they're teaching and who they want to include, how do you have them understand that? Absolutely. I think I want to take a stab at that one. Hey, y'all, give it up for all the people that did get a chance to ask their questions. That's real talk. Eric, we're going to hit you up with the theology. Uh, okay, theology okay. so I, I don't want to steal your thunder because you want me to talk about theology from below, but I can't talk about it separate from that question on, of defining, on ju justice. defining justice, yeah. right? And them both up there. Yeah, to me, ju you know, look at God. What does he do you know, when we talk about justice? God is always committed to the poor, the marginalized, and those who are disconnected, right? Jesus comes to a poor people. He's, he's a slave, right, uh, under Roman rock occupation. Uh, when I see God, God is constantly in relation to justice. It's about rearranging power. It's about, that's what justice is, a just way, right? It's about rearranging power. When God talks about he's near to the broken, the oppressed, those, what he's doing is not, he's not putting the poor over the rich, no more than he wants the rich over the poor. What God does is, is he rearranges power. That's biblical justice, right? So how are we as churches rearranging power in our own life, in our churches? So when we talk about a theology from below, it's taking into consideration what does the Native American, what does the Asian, what does the African American um, have to teach us theologically about life, about God, about discipleship, about economics, about power, justice, whatever? I don't think we take those into consideration. I did this one little piece in my doctoral thing where uh, I went and interviewed a bunch of pastors and social workers who happened to be Christian, and I asked them theologically what informed their work. And not one of them. Not one of them could cite anyone beyond a dead or a live white male that was informing the work on a theological level. That's problematic when you talk about you're going to be an advocate and champion for justice. So I think, the theologically speaking, look at the conferences that, that I, I go to. They're mostly white men speaking on behalf of urban interests. That's a problem. That's a theology from above. So when I talk about theology from below, it's sitting here and I'm, I'm upstairs blown away at what informs Pastor Seiko's work, right? Like he's talking about Pentecostalism, speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues. I'm Pentecostal. And he's connecting it to social justice. Profound in that green room just talking about that kind of work. So when I think of theology from below, it's taking into consideration something that you can't be in control of. It's breaking free right. of this single narrative. And that's what the Bible does when you take the scriptures serious. Right on, man. Great answer. Give Eric some love. Joanne, I want you to add to that. So the question, what does justice look like? Justice look like, uh, looks like it doesn't matter what zip code you live in, you have the same quality of life in the community that you live in. What justice looks like is when you see a black kid surrounded by 10, 12 gang enforcement officers that you stop your car, you bear witness, you stand there, you observe. 
you find out if that young person needs your contact info. What justice looks like is that you will interrupt inappropriate behavior by your friends and your loved ones and the people that you worship with. That's what justice looks like. Justice is something that, in my mind, it is so achievable, but it is only achievable if we all see it as our individual roles to step into those places. Let me tell you how tiring it is to be an African-American woman trying to explain being an African-American woman to white men and women all day, every day, right? And I have spent some quality time doing that over the years. Uh, but I find that the older I get, the less patience I have for those conversations. And so what I'm about now is if you're working for justice, you are standing with me and you're asking, how can I help? Right? That's right. what justice would look like. All right. And give her some love for that. I'll, I'll try to make my response brief to, to Aaliyah's question about how do you help colleges who have diversity statements actually really do diversity work? And Eric, I'm gonna borrow a little bit from your narrative and give a brief story. It's very brief. Um, and then I'm gonna respond to something you said earlier in your talk, Brother Seku. That is this, um, last year, well, Warner Pacific College is part of it, um, a council for Christian colleges called the CCCU. We're, we're a body of like 118, 121 colleges and universities. And um, one of the things, we went to a CCCU uh, national conference last year that was in LA. Um, and I remember every time we would go into the banquet room, I would just see a sea of white people, man. Just like just a sea of white people who are kind of the major decision makers uh, within the CCCU. But then you would always see a pocket of people of color, right? And all the people of color that I you know, knew or that I was getting to know, probably 90% of the people of color there were doing some type of diversity job. You know what I mean? They were doing some kind of diversity job. And, and, and it really hit me more than ever that if we're really going to do um, substantive change structurally and systemically, we're going to have to have people of color, not co just cosmetic people of color, but with the lived experience, a lived reality, a cultural sensibility, really being some power players and making some decisions on, the, on these institutions. So if you really want to um, live into diversity, Aaliyah, and make sure that it's on campus. It can't be, um, you know, one person can't be the arbiter of that work, or one student group can't be the arbiter of that work, or it can't be marginalized to some, some, some type of diversity office. It's going to take real staff people, real people in power, lived experience, lived realities, cultural sensibilities that makes that um, diversity work well. That's what we need to do. Hey, y'all, Sekou, you got the last word. Whatever the Spirit tells you to say, give it to us, man. I can hear my neighbor crying, saying I can't breathe. And now I'm in the struggle, saying I can't leave. We're calling out the violence of the racist police. And we ain't gonna stop. Until the people are free, say it with me. I can hear my neighbor crying, saying I can't breathe, saying I can't breathe. And now I'm in the struggle, saying I can't leave. We're calling out, we're calling out the violence of the racist police. And we ain't gonna stop until the people are free. Hey, we ain't gonna stop until the people are free. Say it one more time. I can hear my neighbor crying, saying I can't breathe. And now I'm in the struggle. Saying I can't leave. We're calling out the violence of the racist police. And we ain't gonna stop until the people are free. Hey, 
we ain't gonna stop until the people are free. God bless you and thank you for being part of this conversation. Thanks to Warner Pacific College for hosting it. Black Lives Matter. Thank you all. Good night.